Hello, and welcome to Radcliffe Cardiology's live webinar in association with Medtronic. I'm Professor Roseanne Kenny from St. James's Hospital and Trinity College Dublin, and I'll be moderating this webinar today. It's a pleasure to have two well-known experts in the field of syncope here with us. I'm pleased to introduce Mrs. Jane Mudd, who is a nurse consultant in cardiac rhythm management at the James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough, and Professor Jean-Claude de Harreau, who is a cardiologist electrophysiologist at the Hospital Timon in Marseille, France, and Professor of Cardiology in Marseille's Medical School. They will each present and discuss today the recommendations for the practical application of the 2018 ESC syncope guidelines with respect to diagnosis and follow-up care of syncope patients. But before we begin, I'd like this webinar to be as interactive as possible, and I'd encourage you to ask Jane and Jean-Claude questions by using the text box on your screen during the course of the webinar. They will answer as many questions as possible at the end of each presentation. You will also have an opportunity to participate in our live opinion polls, so please feel free to join in. And if you wish to participate in those polls, and you're watching this in full screen, you'll have to return to the smaller view to see the voting options that are available. So, to start the webinar, and to gain an understanding of you, our audience, we have a short poll question available now on your screen to get us started. And the question is, to which level are the ESC 2018 syncope guideline recommendations being followed at your institution? A is less than 25%, next is 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, and D, more than 75%. So please respond to A, B, C or D now. And in the guidelines, the content has been updated, including some videos and practical demonstration. And I wonder if either of our presenters um, have any particular new area that they would like to highlight while we're waiting for the responses from our viewers. Maybe you, Jane, is there any particular area that you found to be useful in the, particularly useful in the new guidelines? Yes, well, personally, I was absolutely delighted to see that the valuable contribution that nurses can bring to the management of patients with syncope has been highlighted in the new guidance. Okay, that's good. The, the role of the nurse and Jean-Claude, was there anything? Well, I think the practical information is very um, well uh, emphasised in these guidelines, in the addendum of the, of the guidelines. So I really recommend to go to this part of the guidelines. Yes, in the addendum of the guidelines. Um, and we've got our voting through now, and I'd be interested in your views about this. So less than 25%, 20, <clears throat> 23%. So the majority are between 20, of 25 to 50% of uh, our viewers, institutions, are using the recommendations and following them in the institution. So 25 to 50%. What do you think about that, Jane? Are you okay. surprised? Not really, no. Um, in fact, it's probably a little bit higher than I expected, so that's quite pleasing. Jean-Claude? Well, that's a good start. It just means that we, we should really uh, be convincing today. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So now, um, uh, I, I'm going now to hand over to our first <clears throat> presenter, that's Jane Mudd, uh, and, she, and she will discuss the implementation of a new standard for diagnosing syncope. Jane. Thank you, Rosanne, and I'm very happy to be here today. I'm going to talk to you about a pathway that we have developed in the centre that I work in, which is the James Cook University Hospital, which is a large tertiary centre in the northeast of England. And we have a dedicated service for arrhythmia and syncope management. We actually developed our nurse-delivered, nurse-led service in 2010. And I say delivered and led in slightly differently is because although the nurses are the people who are delivering the service directly to the patients, we have strong clinical support from our consultant cardiologist and our consultant neurophysiologist, and that's really important. It's a multidisciplinary, multi-specialty model. And I think it very much reflects the recommendations that were made by the European Society of Cardiology in 2018. 
They identified that a structured care pathway was very important to maximise implementation of the guidelines and also they highlighted that this would be uh, beneficial to have a dedicated syncope unit or dedicated service and that it should be led by a clinician with specific knowledge of transient loss of consciousness with the necessary team members working with them and they actually identified the clinical nurse specialist. I've already mentioned that key to the successful, successful delivery of the structured pathway is a multidisciplinary approach and experience and training in key components of cardiology, neurology, emergency and geriatric medicine are, are pertinent. And they also identified that nurses may be expected to take on very important roles. And I'm going to go on to talk to you about that using our service as an example. So when we first decided that we needed to look at our existing service, which wasn't really fit for purpose, we decided that we would do an audit. And we looked at 100 sets of patient notes. And the aim was to examine the existing pathway and I'm sure that our findings will be of no great surprise to you. We found that there was lots of costly and inappropriate investigations, omission of important investigations, high rates of hospitalisation, which were quite often unnecessary, and some prolonged stays in hospital. We also found there were multiple attendances to accident and emergency departments, and quite often there were multiple referrals to multiple specialties. So at that point, people that were referring into the service quite often weren't sure where to actually send the patients. So they would send them to, for example, cardiology and neurology at the same time. And we also found that there was evidence of misdiagnosis. This was an example that we found for our, our initial audit. And I will admit that it's quite an extreme case, but it was not in isolation. There were other cases that were very similar. And as you can see, this is a very prolonged pathway. This actually goes from 2001 to 2011, 10 years before this gentleman who originally had, was presented, uh, presented with a blackout in 2001 to the accident and emergency department, eventually after bouncing between different departments, consultant physicians, neurologists, consultant neurologists, GPs, cardiology, eventually had a diagnosis and had a pacemaker implanted in 2011. So our pathway at that time was very disjointed. As I've already highlighted, there was multiple specialties that the patients were being referred to. There was lots of crossing between specialties before the patients eventually got to where they needed to be. We decided that we needed to look at the whole pathway and we needed to involve everybody who may be involved in that pathway. And this is a, a, really what our blackout multidisciplinary team looks like. So we have input from cardiology, from neurology, from accident and emergency, uh, from elderly care, from anybody who may be involved with that patient along the pathway. As I've said, it is a nurse-led service and all of our nurses have cardiology or neurology experience or both. Education and qualification is very important. So all of the nurses who are delivering this service are qualified to at least master's level. They all have non-medical prescribing qualifications, clinical assessment qualifications, and the nurses in our service have all completed a master's level arrhythmia and syncope module. Very important is the in-house competency-based training that they un undertake. And they also have regu regular educational sessions via our multidisciplinary team meetings, which we hold on a monthly basis, which are really useful to discuss difficult cases. And as I say, are very, very useful for education. Our pathway now is very streamlined. There is one point of referral. People don't need to think about where to send the patient. They can just send the patient to the blackout clinic. We will triage the referrals and we will, we will send the patients to where they need to be. So what happens when they actually get to the service? Well, before they even get there, we will have triaged the referral. So if it's not appropriate, we will make sure that we direct the referral to where it needs to be. When the patients attend clinic, they're seen by the nurses. We do have same day access to the consultants, but very few of our patients actually need to be seen by the consultants. We manage the bulk of the patients that come through the service. We try to offer a one-stop shop where possible so we can perform history taking, witness accounts, clinical examination, and undertake any of the tests that are required, most of which we can perform on the same day. 
The majority of our referrals come from the accident and emergency department. That's around 52% of them. We have a very good relationship with our emergent accident and emergency department. The turnaround in that department is quite fast. We have new doctors coming through all the time. So we have to make sure that we keep going back down and repeating the education with them. We have a very structured pathway in place that enables them to refer very quickly to us. Around 44% of our referrals come from primary care with 4% from other sources. So what's the pathway effective? Well, we found that it's been very effective. So some of the results that we saw is we saw that there was a reduction in admissions. So we saw there was an average reduction of 41 admissions per month, which equates to a reduction of approximately 800 bed days. We also found that there was a reduction in waiting times for first assessment. And also we found that we were making diagnosis a lot faster. If you compare our waiting times to Blackout Clinic, which is actually around 14 days, to neurology at 90 days, cardiology around 60 days, and First Fit Clinic at around 50 days, you can see that we can actually see the patients much faster. The majority of our patients receive a diagnosis very quickly, with around 72% of them receiving a diagnosis at the first appointment. Of course, some of the patients need to have further investigations, and therefore we do have a review service as well. So I'm going to talk to you about a patient that's actually come through the new pathway. And this was a lady who was referred by her general practitioner. She's a 78 year old lady and she had a past medical history of epilepsy and breast cancer. And the only medication that she was taking when she came to clinic was an Amotrigine 300 milligrams twice daily. She'd had two episodes of no, no warning loss of consciousness and both of these had occurred within a one month period. On one occasion, she had sustained a facial injury. One event was unwitnessed, but fortunately one event had been witnessed by a friend who described the lady as being very pale in color, breathing pattern was normal, she had a limp body tone, there was no abnormal limb, limb movement or other seizure markers that were identified, and she was said to have had her eyes open throughout the event. She was unconscious for approximately one minute and she had a really quick recovery with no residual, residual symptoms post-event. Clinical examination was unremarkable other than the fact that she did have a postural drop in blood pressure uh, when going from lying to standing uh, from 154 over 96 to 132 over 84, but this recovered over a two minute period. Her ECG in clinic demonstrated normal sinus rhythm At this point, obviously, we were considering what the diagnosis was. Both events had occurred during or following her eating, and she had a postural drop in blood pressure. And we could have been led to believe that this was all related to blood pressure. But because she'd had two events without any warning, we were very keen to rule out a cardiac cause. We did think that it was beneficial to fit a seven day ambulatory ECG monitor to see if we could capture anything on there because both of the events had been fairly close together. That actually didn't reveal any significant abnormality. So at that point, we discussed her management with our cardiologist and he suggested that she should have an implantable loop recorder fitted. The patient was admitted to the day unit. She was seen by the nurse who explained the procedure, clocked and consented by the nurse. It's the nurses who actually implant the devices and the nurses who actually program the devices. We also follow all the patients up. So we, we use the CareLink system. So one of the daily routine jobs of the, from the nurse is that we check the system every morning to see if there have been any patient events, whether they be patient activated or automated events. And with this particular lady, she did send, uh, we, we did get an automated event. And as you can see, this demonstrated, sorry, just go back, this demonstrated a, a progressive bradycardia uh, followed by some sinus pauses. We contacted the lady and she did explain that she'd had another episode of loss of consciousness and that correlated with the automated event. And once again, she had been sat eating, interestingly. Again, it had been a no warning event with a quick recovery. So we diagnosed symptomatic sinus bradycardia with sinus pauses. We discussed the case on the same day with the cardiologist. And on the same day, she was added to the waiting list to have a permanent pacemaker fitted.
She was agreeable to having the procedure, of course, and she went on to have a dual chamber pacemaker implanted. The timeline with regards to this pathway is very different to the example I gave you previously. This is 68 days in total from the lady being referred to us to actually having the pacemaker implanted. So a, a, a very big change in, in pathway um, with regards to where we started. So in summary, nurse delivered models of care as recommended by ESC 2018 have proven to be safe and effective. This is just one example of a syncope service, a nurse led syncope service. And I think there's a, a definitely a need for more research specific to these types of services to help others who are thinking about developing similar services. As I highlighted, the support from an identified clinical lead is essential, whether that be a lead in cardiology, a lead in neurology, a need in elderly care, that doesn't really matter, but you do need a clinical lead. Education is of paramount importance and more formalised education programmes need to be developed. And I know that there is discussion ongoing at the moment with pertinent groups looking at how we can develop more structured education if we are going to find that more nurses are going to be developing and leading on these services. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Jane. That was lovely. You've, you've so nicely highlighted not just the role of the nurse in, in this sort of a care pathway, but the leading role of a nurse. And I, I've had a, 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 a great question here, if I may, um, um, about the underlying cause of syncope, um, given that the events all occurred whilst she was eating. Do you want to maybe respond to that in the context of uh, maybe the uh, ILR uh, reading that we have? Yes, yeah. Oh, OK, thank you. So, um, yes, this is, this is likely to be uh, vasovagal in, in nature. And you can see from the automated event that you do have this progressive bradycardia followed by sinus pauses, with, which should actually fit with that. Mm -hmm. And I have another good question here um, about the seven-day monitor. How useful is seven-day ECG monitoring in these cases? Okay, I think it's down to clinical judgment at the time and they can be very useful. In this case, we didn't actually detect anything, but because the lady had had two events fairly close to each other, we felt that it was beneficial to try that first before going straight to an implantable loop recorder. Um, another question here. Um, uh, you, you, you described during the presentation 52% uh, of referrals came through the ED. Would you just give us a little bit more uh, information about how that pathway works, how that screening process works? Okay. The relationship with the emergency department is very, very important. And when we developed the service, we spent a, a lot of time working with them uh, to find out how we could develop a structured pathway. We put the pathway together and we actually have that around the emergency department so people can see it very easily. Uh, we have it on a, a computer system. It's very simple for them to fill in. And the feedback we actually got from them when we first implemented this is that they found that the uh, assessments from the junior doctors really improved because they had this dedicated pathway that they could actually follow. They just complete the, path, uh, the referral pathway, send it to us, and we see the patients very quickly. Because we see them very quickly, they feed back to us that they are much less likely to admit the patients. Okay. No, another nice one here. So apart from a cardiac pacemaker, um, which the patient received, are there any other interventions that you would recommend? Well, we'd obviously uh, consider conservative management. We would look at the patient's medication, for example, and lifestyle advice is very important. So considering fluid intake and also one of the other things that we always discuss is counter-physical manoeuvres and things like that. Um, and, and, and also um, a challenging question, uh, possibly, if you had the same findings in an 18-year-old female, would your intervention be the same and your process be the same? No, absolutely not. Um, in an elderly patient, it's much more likely to be a fixed response. Um, with a younger patient, it, it would not be beneficial to jump straight in and, and uh, advise a permanent, permanent pacemaker. Potentially, you then have a young person who has a device fitted, who is at risk of potential complications, lead displacement, replacement devices. So no, we would think about it very differently. Would you do any further investigations to kind of unmask a little bit behind the, the possible etiology um, over and above what we're done in an 18-year-old, say? In an 18-year-old, yes. Possibly we may have looked at tilt testing and um, sort of blood pressure monitoring and things like that. Okay, thank you.
Now, that's, that was fantastic, and thank you very much, Jane. And I'm going to ask now our colleague, Professor Dehero, who will discuss monitoring high-risk syncope patients and putting guidelines into practice in that context. So, Jean-Claude. Well, thank you, Rosanne. And I, I was very impressed by the presentation of Jane. This is a very mm -hmm. interesting example of uh, how to manage these uh, syncope units. So, um, we'll be also discussing about the management of patients in uh, syncope units, but now we'll be dealing with high risk syncope patients. These are my disclosures. And of course, I will be uh, mentioning uh, during my presentation this. Uh, to 2018 ESC guidelines for diagnosis and management of syncope, which uh, we already mentioned and are very practical and very, and we, we think very useful. Well, first of all, um, keep in mind that these uh, syncope units are very important. You can see here that uh, two uh, documents, one coming from the ERA, the other from the ESC, are mentioning the importance of these syncope units. They are important not only for uh, the diagnosis, uh, which uh, can be uh, increased in, in terms of, of yield and speed, we, we saw it from chain presentation. Also from a healthcare perspective, because uh, we, we see that costs are saved with these uh, facilities. And also, I think that for research is very important because data are, are collected uh, in a very systematic way and this is very important. Regarding the, the key components of a syncope unit, you, you see that there are many, many types of syncope units. One is with nurses who, uh, led the, uh, who lead the, the, the syncope unit. Others are with doctors uh, leading the syncope unit. The important thing is that there, there should be some syncope specialist somewhere. And um, it depends on the local organization. Sometimes it's inside a cardiology department. Sometimes it's Really, really uh, another uh, another facility. So it is really uh, clearly explained in, in in the guidelines, and and it's important to refer to these uh, explanations in order to set up this kind of facilities. Well, I would I would like to to explain uh, our patient with a high risk, we will see it, will be managed in such a syncope unit, like our syncope unit, which is a syncope unit which is inside the electrophysiology department of the cardiology department of a tertiary referral center, which is actually a university hospital in, in Marseille, France. So this patient was a female, 38 year old, and she had a um, history of transient ischemic attack two years ago, at that time, um, it was diagnosed due to this transient ischemic attack, a mitral valve prolapse, which was not known before. And uh, she was uh, put on oral anticoagulants since this transient ischemic attack. Actually, she attends the syncope unit uh, after free syncope during the last two years. One episode uh, occurred while she was walking, going upstairs. Uh, two episodes occurred in a prolonged standing position in her, uh, in her house. Episodes were always preceded by palpitations. This is very important to me. She had no other prodromes. She had no real prodromes, only these palpitations and after this, uh, this uh, syncope. And of course, uh, she had mild trauma because she could not avoid uh, the, the falling on the, on the floor sometimes. The ECG of the patient is very important to me. You, you see that this ECG uh, shows uh, frequent PVCs. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is very important because these PVCs are coming from the papillary muscle. We can see here that uh, these PVCs are, are um, have a typical pattern coming from the papillary muscle and the, from the posterior papillary muscle in this case. This is important because they have been described in patients with uh, mitral valve prolapse and, and some of them have a high risk of, uh, of uh, ventricular um, arrhythmias. So in this case, this ECG is very uh, contributive. Physical examination showed that the patient has a mitral click sound, no systolic murmur. She had no other abnormality. Autostatic hypotension was not present in this case. 
and the echocardiogram was key in this case. You see here that the mitral valve prolapse is, is really easy to see with this valve prolabing uh, towards the plane of the mitral annulus. You see this redundant valve, which is very, uh, very uh, important in this case. And we also see in the lower part of the echo ear, we see what we call the, the uh, mitral annulus uh, disjunction, meaning that some of the actual uh, tissue is coming inside into the ventricle during the systole, meaning that really there is a strong motion of the mitral annulus in this patient due to this uh, mitral wave product. So it's what is sometimes called a complex, a complex uh, mitral wave prolapse. So it really gives an important information to us. This patient has not a very simple, uh, I would say, uh, a usual mitral valve prolapse. In this case, you have PVC, you have syncope first, you have PVCs, and you have these very uh, redundant valves and this important prolapse with the motion of the annulus. We decided to um, monitor the patient. Uh, and this was performed in our syncope unit, meaning that the patient was not admitted to the hospital. This is important to consider in this case. The patient was referred to home with a 12-lead halter monitoring, which was very important to us. We, wanted, we really wanted to know if his PVCs were, were very frequent during the day, if they were repetitive. And we see here that, for example, uh, in this 12-lead uh, halter monitoring that she had for 24 hours, we could see uh, non-unsustained ventricular tachycardia. You see here uh, an unsustained ventricular tachycardia here, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia in this panel. We also performed the uh, treadmill test because one of the syncope occurred during uh, the patient going upstairs. It's important to tell that we do not perform each, we do not perform such a test for, for every patient, but in this case it was important because one of the syncopy occurred during, uh, during uh, walking and going upstairs. And you can see here that we have very repetitive PVCs and, and really a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia starting here, stopping, starting here, stopping. Really, it seems that catecholamines are really uh, uh, playing an important role in, in making more complex ventricular arrhythmias in this patient who already has PVCs and uh, unsustained VT, monomorphic VT, on, uh, on the 12-lead uh, halter monitoring. The MRI evaluation was important. It's, it's, it's very important to perform it because really it confirms that the mitral valve prolapse is complex and it shows this mitral annular disjunction. You see here that the atrial tissue is coming towards the ventricle here. So it's really a, a motion of the annulus which, 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 is, which is responsible for, for this mitral annular disjunction. And we also see, we don't actually we don't see it very well here, but you see here some late gadolinium enhancement showing fibrosis in the region of the papillary muscles. And this has been shown to be associated in, in some patients with uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias in case of mitral valve prolapse. So really, uh, the, 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 the phenotype of this patient is the one of a complex mitral valve prolapse with many, many um, informations telling that this patient might be prone to have uh, complex ventricular arrhythmias, which might explain the sync. So I think that um, when we see a patient with syncope, there are many questions we have to answer. But in the syncope, in the, in the ESC guidelines, we really think that these four questions are key questions. First of all, is it a T-log? Is it a syncope? In this case, yes. And then, and this is at the same level, is there a diagnosis and which is the risk? And I would say that in this patient, the question, question number four, number three is very important because we really do think that there is a risk in this patient. I mean a risk of a severe ventricular arrhythmia with a, a poor outcome of the patient.
You also know that there are some red flags feature that, that can occur in patients with syncope. In this case, for example, syncope occurred during exertion or in, in this case during exertion. Uh, syncope was associated with sudden onset palpitations immediately followed by syncope. This is uh, uh, really a feature which is, which is a high-risk feature. There were no warning symptoms, or very short, and for this reason the patient had mild trauma. So this patient really was on the, on the high-risk side of the patients with syncope. She also had uh, VT, and uh, we, we could see that the VT was either monomorphic or polymorphic during the uh, treadmill test, and this is clearly in favor of a cardiac syncope. So our patient is really coming to be a patient with a, with a high risk and probably a cardiac syncope due to ventricular arrhythmia, and this might be related to the uh, mitral valve prolapse of the patient. You see here again that she had many of the features which are considered as features of uh, 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 high-risk uh, syncope. In this case, and this is very important, and this, this is a bit new in, in these guidelines, in some patients, a monitoring strategy, in some high-risk patients, a monitoring strategy can be performed, meaning that in these patients, we can still wait for documenting the uh, exact cause of a syncope. We don't need to be such proactive in, in really uh, performing any therapy or any other uh, investigation. We can wait because we already performed many investigations. We really think that this patient is in the pathway of, of a high-risk patient, but still we want to monitor. We want to monitor. We, we, don't want, we are not so sure and we really want to monitor. So it's, it's tricky because she has a high risk and still we... Uh, would like to, to wait for, for, uh, for documentation of, of syncope. This is uh, recommended, and you see here that after, in patients with iris arrhythmia, likely, which is this case of patient, you can uh, start by performing any kind of monitoring, in hospital monitoring sometimes, which was not the case here because the syncope episodes were not so frequent, mm -hmm. but if negative, you can go to the ILR. So, mm -hmm. meaning that there is a room still for the ILR in this kind of patients. Maybe we'll discuss it mm -hmm. later. And this is a class 1A indication after performing, of course, many of the investigations which will uh, not um, uh, show that there is an indication for a pacemaker or an ICD, of course. This is true, of course, in the case of our patient with mitral vase prolapse, but also in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Instead of an ICD, sometimes you can use this monitoring strategy in order to be sure before implanting an ICD or not. Same for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very high-risk patients. Patients with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, high-risk patients, of course, we, we all know it's a 2A indication. Uh, patients with long QT syndrome, sometimes you have to uh, monitor these kind of patients instead of implanting right away a pacemaker or an ICD in this case. And, some, uh, and same thing for Brugada syndrome. It's not uncommon that you don't know in a patient with a Brugada syndrome. Is it a reflex syncope? Is it a syncope due to ventricular arrhythmia due to this Brugada syndrome? In some patients, you have to uh, monitor. We decided to, to, to monitor with, with this patient. We implanted a, an ILR. And you see here that very soon after implantation, the patient went back to the syncope clinic with palpitations. We also use the care link, and the nurses are looking at, at the tracings every day, and she had palpitations and monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And then she had palpitations and dizziness, a very severe dizziness, very, very close to syncope that she, she had before. And you see here that there was really a uh, very, uh, very uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And in this case, we were very, uh, very, uh, we thought it was a very risky situation and we decided to implant an ICD, but maybe we will discuss later. So um, in order to conclude, first of all, I would like that management of syncope uh, 
using uh, the um, using the uh, syncope units is very important. This is important not only in, in, in all patients, but also in patients who come to the emergency department with a high risk sometimes, or come like this patient uh, to the syncope unit directly uh, referred from a cardiologist. Uh, ECG monitoring strategy is very important, and, and it, is all, it is important to keep in mind that it can be used also in patients with high risk, of course, when an ICD or pacemaker is not indicated right away. And finally, I would like to emphasize that there is uh, now a common phenotype in patients who experience uh, very severe arrhythmia, and this phenotype is the one we observed in patients with female patients, middle age, with syncope or near syncope, with this kind of very severe mitral valve prolapse, with PVCs, unsustained VT, and in these patients, it might be uh, appropriate sometimes to implant an ICD. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude. That was a fascinating presentation. It covered the whole spectrum from the red flags in the history right through to capturing a symptom rhythm correlation, both during palpitations and then palpitations with dizziness. Uh, coupled with your monomorphic and then polymorphic uh, tachycardia. So a really interesting case. And it actually, um, it, 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 that, that dovetails nicely into one of the first questions, if I could ask you from the audience. Um, would you refer uh, this patient for electrophysiological study or these patients or maybe discuss the role of EP study in these patients? Well, these patients are, are really patients in whom we don't really know what to do. We, we are not sure that the EP study will be really useful because there are no evidence in the literature showing that, for example, uh, uh, ventricular stimula program ventricular stimula stimulation would be interesting. So uh, we did not perform uh, such an EP study, and I think there's no strong evidence in the literature for, for doing it. And for this reason, monitoring was so important. Okay, yeah. And, and the next question, um, which uh, which I think you've already covered, but there's no harm in just repeating the key issues because the case shows it so nicely. Do you have red flags for concern about syncope from the patient's history and physical examination that could be due to potentially lethal cardiac arrhythmias? Yes. In this case, for example, there were these palpitations yes. before the syncope. There were also these PVCs, these uh, unsustained ventricular tachycardia yes. sh showed on the whole yes. time. So definitely, yes. 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 These yes. kind of red flags are present. But I would like to emphasize that this case was not so easy because in some patients, like a patient with a left ventricular dysfunction of, or a patient with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, these flags really lead you to implant an ICD. Yes. In this case, the, um, the therapy is not so, uh, uh, so easy to, to decide. So uh, this is why we, we did not uh, immediately implant an ICD. But I agree that there were red flags showing that she was really exposed to very severe ventricular arrhythmias. And that actually uh, leads nicely into this, this question from one of the listeners. Um, would you recommend surgery in these patients? Well, surgery in patients with mitral red products is mainly for, for correcting uh, mitral regurgitation, which is not the case here. And it has never shown that it, it, would, uh, it would change the prognosis of patients with severe arrhythmia like, like this patient. So she will not be operated until she has a severe uh, mitral regurgitation and a conventional indication for, for this. It, it, if, if it was the case, that the patient had no history of palpitations or syncope during exertion, but just had syncope, and then on the electrocardiogram, say a 12-lead electrocardiogram, had the monomorphic ventricular ectopics that you showed, should that patient go on to echo and further cardiac investigations? Yes, it, it is surprising, but patients with mitral valve prolapse do not experience uh, sudden cardiac death or syncope always during, uh, during, uh, uh, during uh, an effort, you, you mean, uh, they, they can have something at rest. S and, and sometimes they, they start their history by, uh, by, by a very, uh, very severe event. So yes, I would recommend to go to the echo. So syncope kind of and these, are, these, are ventri yes. these types of ventricular yes. ectopics, that yes. sort of a yes. configuration yes. we yes. think and about an, that. And an abnormal uh, clinical examination also should prompt to the uh, okay. echo. Okay. Now, um, 
Another question here about the, the, the model of care you, you described very early on in the presentation. Can you explain the immediate um, management of the patient with respect to your hospital admission model and any other pathways that, that might be yeah, considered? Yeah, yes, there are other, other pathways. It really depends on the local organisation. Uh, such a patient could be hospitalised. Uh, well, I'm not sure it will be really useful because uh, she had syncope every, uh, every six months. So I'm not sure we will capture anything during an hospitalisation. And we don't have any major investigation to perform during hospitalisation. But it can be done uh, for uh, one or two days in order to really be sure that uh, she has mitral vertebrae and all these things. Also, she can be managed uh, in a very, uh, in, a, in, in a syncope unit like, like this one, but should be managed in a very short period of time. I think the very important thing in this case is that this patient should not be lost or follow up, of course. She, would, she should be referred to specialists of this kind of mitral rave prolapse. We, we should really have a very, uh, very short time period before having the opinion of patients from the electrophysiology department and from the echo, uh, from the mitral valve uh, department, um, uh, yeah. valve disease department. Yeah. So this is, this is my opinion. Hospitalization could be performed, but I'm not sure it will be really useful. I would be very interested in having your opinion, for example. What yeah. would you I, suggest? I, I think it's, I think it, I think the, the, well, first of all, coming back to the model of a sink bay unit. It's important that that model fits with your institution because then it doesn't happen at all. That's been our experience. And in these high risk patients, it's, it's wonderful if you have an opportunity to do um, uh, immediate admission to an observational unit, either in ED or I think your unit is pretty unique in having it in the electrophysiology laboratory. Um, and I, uh, the issue studies pretty much showed that um, it's safe as long as you're monitoring these red flag patients, as long as they're continuing to be monitored. Um, th th they more or less concluded that it was safe as long as they were being monitored to wait for recurrence of symptoms, etc. So that, that's what I would say. And, and, and sorry, and Jane, would you hospitalize this patient in your, in your uh, institution, for example, right away or? Probably yes. Probably yes. Yes, yes. observation, yes. I can, mm -hmm. I can uh, yes. So I think that's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you both uh, our distinguished speakers for answering our viewers' questions today and for the valuable insights into these two really interesting cases and, and, and uh, s cases which represent what we not uncommonly see in syncope practice. During the webinar, we've learned how to maximize the implementation of the guidelines by setting up a cohesive, structured care pathway for the assessment of patients with suspected syncope and that a structured care pathway either delivered within a single syncope facility or as a more multifaceted service is optimal for quality service delivery. Professor Deherro showed us how a structured approach is also pertinent to patients with suspected arrhythmic cardiac syncope, when in this case the history gave a clear indication that the patient should be stratified to a high risk category. Now, both uh, underscore the important role for long-term monitoring in patients with unexplained syncope, which is likely due to a cardiac cause. And I think that's the key message from today's presentation. So I thank you. Thank you, the audience, for your participation in today's webinar. And of course, to our two experts, Ms. Jane Mudd and Professor Jean-Claude Deherreau. It's been a real pleasure having you here today. And thank you all. Uh, for participating. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.